Greetings with lovers everywhere and welcome to E-Train Talks! I'm E-Train, a 12-year-old literacy advocate, podcast host, and booktuber, and today's interview is such a special one because, wow, the author I'm talking with today spreads kindness and generosity in the world, and just recently she introduced us to an incredible new book hero, a Hawaiian heroine, Lei who's teaching us how to be strong. And she's not only strong, but courageous and fierce, and she goes on pretty much the most epic adventure I've really ever read in middle grade. So who am I talking about? Which middle grade author am I going to be talking to? Well, she's the debut author of Lay and the Fire Goddess, a book that Kirkus Reviews describes as an exhilarating, adventure-filled celebration of Hawaiian culture. And not to mention, Lay in the Fire Goddess was also the week junior kids' June book club pick. That's a mouthful. If you've not figured it out already, I'm speaking with the wonderful author, Malia Maunakea. Thank you so much for joining me today, Malia. It's a true honor. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Uh, thank you. So, I am incredibly grateful that you took time out of your day to come on E-Train Talks. You are doing so much good in the world through your writing, but also through your Books for Maui auction, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So to start off, we're actually going to be diving right into it. So later was just two seconds. So you were helping lead the change for the fundraiser Books for Maui, which raised money for the victims of the Maui fire just recently. So how did the idea come about and how did you get the authors to auction off individual visits and how much money did you raise? This was really a collaborative effort. There are seven of us um, women behind the scenes, uh, all of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander heritage that uh, came together. We um Joanna Ho actually of Eyes That Kiss in the Corners uh reached out to a bunch of us on Twitter and we had been kind of all mulling over what are we going to do how are we going to help on our own and she was kind of the glue that binds and brought us all together to be like okay if we're going to do this it's going to help to do it together so we all formed a team had a lot of uh texts going on behind the scenes um but i'm sure as you've known the book community is an amazingly generous wonderful community so once we put the word out there maui holds a very special place in a lot of people's hearts many people have gone to visit or know of somebody who has been impacted so it was lovely being able to tap into that desire to help that was already out there and give them a way to funnel that energy. Well, the work that you did to help Maui truly impacted so many lives and it's going to impact even more. So how much did you raise all in all? We are just about to the end of counting and it looks like with the incredibly generous uh donation from Scholastic of 25000 we wow. are at the $208,000 mark. Well, we've got to give a round of applause for that. <laughs> wow. It's pretty exciting. It, it's really great how everybody came together. We're, we're just absolutely. The, like you said, the book community is just so amazing. There's so many kind people in it. And I'm so, I guess, proud to see the book community all band together for such an important cause so absolutely like, hats off to you and the other six women who worked on this who brought everybody together who created this important fundraiser like pretty much a few days after the Im impact of the fire after it ended so my next question for you is something that i discovered while doing research for you so I read that you actually have ADHD. So do you find that ADHD leads to a bit of a different writing process for you than other authors that you might meet? This is an interesting question because I've always, I've always had ADHD. So I'm not really sure like what it would be like without it. Mm -hmm. um, 
the the closest I can come to understanding is based on feedback from other writers who are sometimes surprised with how many things I have going on <laughs> at one time or um, how many how many things I choose to juggle in mm -hmm. in a day. So I think that yes, it is a little bit different. I think as you can see up here, I have like oh, a lovely wow. planning board that is now blank because I'm in the middle of revisions and not outlining right now. But that is an example of what one of my mentors, Alan Gratz, showed me how to like plot books. I can usually get through about maybe 30 to 60% of plotting before I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to start <laughs> writing. So it's a little tricky to keep um, things straight and it can be really exciting to come up with new projects, but it can be incredibly difficult to get to completion. And right. I find it very challenging to continually do edits because at that point I really want to move on to the next fun, shiny, exciting idea. So it's hard, but I've heard other authors struggle with that as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I am very fidgety and find it very hard to stay on task. <laughs> Well, I totally, it's so cool to hear another person has like the same struggles when it comes to finishing a book as I do. I've got like two chapters in um, of, I guess, a little bit of plotting, but mainly pantsing. And then poof, I'm on to the next shiny object, like you said. So yeah, it's inspiring to see that somebody uh, with the same kind of struggles got to the finish line so I'm gonna keep working on writing and I'm I'm not medicated you know like mm -hmm. I hear it is an amazing helper for some folks I've just never taken the time to like figure that process out so I just go and wing it um but yeah it is possible you can do it you have to really really want to mm -hmm. right so my next question for you is well this is another thing that I discovered while researching. I really got, I've got to dig deep for these interviews. I research a lot. You did a good job. I was very excited to read your questions. <laughs> Thank you. So I read that you're a mixture of Hawaiian, Polish, Chinese, English, Irish, French, Scottish, German, and Spanish. I mean, that is just, I guess, <laughs> crazy, me mental. Because you would think that just being born in a place like Hawaii, there's so many people who have lived there for generations, that there wouldn't be that much, I guess, cultural or con country diversity inside of you. So I'm just cu really curious, is there a story behind your diverse heritage? So my mom is from Buffalo, New York, or upstate okay. New York, and she is pure Polish. Mm -hmm. So that is one half of me <laughs> the other half is everything else my dad is um just over half hawaiian and then as he uh sometimes puts it everybody who jumped ship so hawaii has a lot of sailors coming from around mm -hmm. the world or right. plantation workers um it was a gathering space for people from all walks of life and people from all walks of life found other people interesting <laughs> and came together to make me yeah. um yeah it's there's that's actually not that uncommon in Hawaii that you're this mixed plate of all sorts of interesting backgrounds and it what it's what makes Hawaii so interesting to be in because um it's more about the individual person and less about the ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fun. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of fun and it makes a lot of sense. So now let's dive into talking about your amazing debut middle grade novel, Lay and the Fire Goddess, 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 Goddess. For the for a first book, I've got to say, you really brought out all the adventure and fantasy stops. I I would compare it to the highest of fantasy in my book, like probably up there in the top five. It's just chef's kiss amazing. So 
I know that you're going to dive a, li a little bit more into the book, but what I can share without spoiling anything and also spoiling your answer is that you were inspired, your epic debut story was inspired by your son's love of Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson series. And that also kind of inspired my love of fiction adventure as well. So without giving away any spoilers, will you share more into why and I guess how the Percy Jackson saga motivated you to write and I guess how it intertwined into your writing and can you share a peek into the world of Leia and the Fire Goddess to everyone who's turning who's to everyone who's tuning in yeah so can I share a little secret with you mm -hmm. you know the whole ADHD thing and yeah. how sometimes it's hard to finish things I never actually finished Percy and the Fire Goddess, Percy Jackson and the Fire Goddess, or F Percy Jackson and the things. Yeah. <laughs> I never finished Percy Jackson. Oh. Um, yeah, so I read the first few chapters and I tried watching the movie with my son, um, but I don't know, he had already seen it. And so we never got through it like the third time. <laughs> But he read it and he read it and he read it and he kept loving it. And he's read every single Rick Riordan book ever under the sun and talks about him constantly. So I felt <laughs> like I had a pretty good understanding of what was going on. Um, I did when doing research. So basically came up with the idea like, OK, my son absolutely loves this guy. I got a good idea of what's going on. I know the basic synopsis and storyline of what's happening. Um, so I went to my librarians and asked, hey, are there any other books other than Greek stories um, that follow this kind of storyline? She's like, well, yeah, he has an entire Rick Riordan Presents. And she showed me Aru Shah. And that book I read from cover to cover because that I thought was fabulous. Um, oddly enough, I read it after I had drafted Oh. Lay, so I'm really glad that there wasn't a Hawaiian one already out there. <laughs> um, but then I got really nervous because she had the bird Boo in there. And I was like, oh, my goodness, that's just like my side character. And what if people think I copied? And it was the whole thing. Thankfully, nobody thinks that I've copied her. And she writes amazing stories anyways. So that is my secret. I've never actually finished Percy Jackson. I'm sure it is wonderful. Um, Obviously, it's a huge hit with everybody. I just know the gist of it. Mm -hmm. For Lay, I wanted just a big adventure. And I started writing with plot in mind and with the understanding of this thing happens and she has to solve it and she goes on this journey in the middle, which I le later learned was called the hero's journey. Very traditional, like... Yeah book writing, book planning. Yeah. And I learned a lot about character development along mm -hmm. the way and with my mentors. So the book changed immensely from its original conception to what you read now. So I'm hoping to see more Hawaiian mythology come from Lay and the Fire Goddess. And I think that you're really going to inspire a new wave of writers. It's exciting. I mentioned the uh, seven women that I've been working with for books for Maui. Um, Shar Tuiasoa has Punky Aloha. That's a picture book that's already out. And she's working on another picture book right now. And within that group, there is Keala Kendall, who's an incredible like YA Hawaiian mm -hmm. uh, Kanaka author. And um, Keolani has another picture book coming out next year so there are a lot of hawaiian and polynesian stories that are finally getting championed so in the next couple of years we're going to see great things and megan kakimoto's book just came out every drop is a man's nightmare like it's really nifty to see that our bookshelves are going to have more representation soon so i know that you were born and raised in hawaii and you grew up hearing lots of hawaiian stories and legends just like lei so I'm curious to know if you included anything from these tales you grew up with in Lay's story. And did you have to do much research to write this book as you had pretty much heard a lot of these tales in your own childhood? So for the first 
for Lay and the Fire Goddess, I based it the the kernel of interestingness that I had was from a story I had first heard in fourth grade. And my teacher, Mr. Koochi, who I thank in acknowledgments, taught me about um this story here. Oh wow. And it's all about Pele and Poliahu's race down Mauna Kea. Oh yeah. And Poliahu is the snow goddess up on Mauna Kea. And they do this like massive sled race Mm -hmm. down the mountain. So I include a bit of that story along with a few others of, um, for example, Kamapua Mm -hmm. in my book. I allude to the stories that were already in existence, including, well, I'm not going to share that. But I allude to stories that are already in existence. But what I did need to research, I wanted to be accurate in terms of where lava flow, where lava flows happened, where eruptions mm-hmm. happened, um, and where sled races might have happened. Hee holua. There were holua courses. Some of them are still uh, visible, including one on the Kona side of the island, which is where. Um, I pulled some scenes in the book from. So I wanted to be as accurate as possible in retelling these historic areas. So I called um, the Hawaii National Parks and I talked to a lot of their rangers who are familiar with those activities. And I also talked to uh, Mr. Tom Pohaku Stone, who has sort of single-handedly brought back the Holua um, tradition of sled racing. The, the, and he makes them and he takes them to schools and kids go sledding down grassy slopes now. So I was able to pick his brain on exactly how these sleds are created and how fast they go and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So that was the research I did. I wanted those particulars to be accurate. I never really thought about the fact that, well, I mean, I guess you when you read the book, you know that there's certain facts and figures that aren't necessarily something that you would find directly in mythology. So I guess it makes sense that now um, that you had to really do some more research that you couldn't necessarily find in the stories themselves, rather from people, I guess, around the stories. So it's cool that you added like some real elements facts and figures about sleds and that kind of stuff but also really it stayed true to your traditions and it was fun researching for example if you look at the cover of the book behind you or next to you Mm -hmm. um you can see there's a bat on the cover and there are lehua and there are some other trees i wanted the the illustrators kaa illustration amazing 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 And they helped me make sure that we tried to represent the endemic species in Hawaii. So plants and animals that are only found in Hawaii. That was why um, Lay's sidekick ended up being a bat because I wanted it to be an endemic mammal. And it turns out there are only two endemic animal mammals. One is the Hawaiian monk seal and one is a bat. I was like, well, the monk seal can't really go on this adventure. So it's going to be a bat. So What's next? Will we have the chance to follow Leia on another epic journey, or are you planning to move your writing into different directions? You are going to get to go on another fun ride with Leia and friends next summer. Yes, I am working very hard on revising Leia 2 right now, and I am not sure how much I can say, but it's going to be amazing. And she's going to go on a little bit of travel. Ooh, that is beyond exciting. That is the news that I wanted to hear in this interview. <laughs> Woo. I can. So it'll come out June 4th. Mm-hmm. So less than a year from now, that's going to be marked on my calendar yes. here. And it's my last day. It's going to be very fast. So it's oh, my, that's it's my easy last, then. Yeah, it's my last day of school, and when I c- get home from school early, because it always ends early, I'm just it's gonna be at my doorstep, 
I can already picture it. There you go. And I'm just going to be yes. in my bed reading Lay 2. There. It's, it's all I just wait till you see the cover. I'm I'm hoping I'll be able to like show the cover and everything a little later mm -hmm. this month, September. I'm Ooh. not sure when this is going live. But yeah, yeah, it should be up pretty soon and you'll get to see all yeah. the fun. Well, I cannot wait. And this will be out in September at the, well, everybody is probably already seeing this in September. So it's, it's so weird. Perfect. How to, yeah, perfect. <laughs> right? Um, All yeah. the lining up of things. Mm, like you say everything is in the past and then it's out in the future. And they're like, why are they talking about the past? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Time so, is all just mm -hmm. a suggestion, really. Right, exactly. I mean, time is relative, so. Mm hmm So my next question for you is about your very, very exciting trip to Hawaii to visit Title I schools and share Lay's story with over, drumroll please, 2,700 kids. That is absolutely amazing. So incredible. It is bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So will you share how this book trip came about and where you're going to be going to throughout Hawaii? So I it's it's all just amazing. Like the stars completely aligned. This is <laughs> right. meant to be somehow. It was foretold. No. Um I had a dream that I wanted to go back. Like this is my ultimate goal was to go back and talk to kids back there. Cause this is who I wrote the book for is so they could like see themselves in it. Right. Along with helping everybody else yeah. have a picture of what Hawaii life is like. Like it's, it's great because everybody kind of wins. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get back home, but it's expensive to go back to Hawaii and it's, it's expensive to travel mm -hmm. around and to go to all the islands and stuff. So I was trying to think up a way of how I could make it happen out and I was working with one of my aunties over there trying to figure out if we could find some money over here and then I got an email from We Need Diverse Books saying hey they're partnering up with writers and artists across the country and looking for um authors who might be willing to go speak to like one of these seven schools that were all across the country but one of them happened to be on Maui oh, wow. in Kahului Maui I was like well yeah and they were looking for native speakers to go speak to those students I was like yes I mean I'm not close to there at all but <laughs> I would absolutely love yeah, to take right? you up on that offer. I am trying to put a bigger school tour together right now, but that would be super. And my friend Kaolani, who is also one of the seven ladies that I'm working on books from Raleigh, she sent me the email too. So it was like multiple times on my desk that I was, okay, I need to reach out to these people just to see if we can make something happen. Lots of back and forth, lots of planning and moving parts. But ultimately, they were able to say, yes, our people are giving this a go. We are going to send you there. We are going to try to raise the funds. We have a link to um, ask for donations to help sponsor this thing. But you're going to Hawaii. So hurry up and call the schools and figure it out. <laughs> so I started over the summer trying to reach out to all of the Title I schools because I figured they were the ones I went to Title I schools for elementary before getting into Kamehameha. They were the kids that I identified with in elementary school. They were the kids that I wanted to reach to give the books to if possible. So the fact that writers and artists across the country provide books to these students is the most unreal thing, in my opinion. Like Absolutely. that all these kids are going to get a brand new book. That's that is so cool. So right. yeah, we yeah. we just worked on coordinating and I have 17 schools on Hawaii Island, Maui, Oahu, Molokai, and Kauai that I will be going to visit. And I could not be more excited. My next question for you is something that I bet a lot of people do not know. So I bet that not everyone knows that you had another book out in early 2023 
your backpacking guide titled Backpacking with Children, How to Go Lightweight, yes. Have Fun, and Stay Safe on the Trail. So what inspired you to write it? And are you a big hiker yourself? So I, this is the first book that I wrote, oddly, kind of. Well, I wrote it in conjunction. When you write okay. a nonfiction book, you uh, sell it on proposal. So mm -hmm. I wrote the first couple chapters and then I had an outline that I sent out to a bunch of publishers. And while I was waiting to hear back on if anybody was going to take it, I started to write lay because mm -hmm. I'm antsy, ADHD, and I couldn't just like wait. So I started writing the next book. Um, I actually started writing chapter books and they all got denied or, you know, rejected. Mm -hmm. So then I wrote lay. Um, so this book I thought would be the way to start because it was based on things that I knew. I do go backpacking um, a lot more, or I used to do it a lot more than now. I've backpacked probably 3,000 more miles, over 3,000 miles, because I did the Pacific Crest Trail, which is from Mexico mm, to yeah. Canada, all in one swoop, and that's like 2,600 miles. Once you've done that, it's really easy to get to 3,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I take our kids and we've been, my kids probably have 700 miles or so under their belts. And I wrote a book about that experience because we, at the time of writing this, a lot of our friends didn't understand how we could take kids out mm -hmm. backpacking yeah. Yeah. so I figured why not write a how-to help more families get out into the backcountry with their children and that it's really an important read not just to kind of um inspire people to get out backpacking but also people have that inspiration already but they have no idea how to do it and how to specifically get their kids out like you said so it's a really important book and I think it's a really great pairing between the backpacking guide and lay in the fire goddess and i guess speaking of the, like to that do you pref i guess it's a, probably a really tough question for you but do you prefer nonfiction or fiction or like um or what are the reasons behind maybe like oh for this reason i like nonfiction more but for this reason i like fiction i guess that's a long-winded question it's actually a really easy question i don't like nonfiction. i like fiction <laughs> um <laughs> in writing this uh, backpacking with children book there was so much more research to be done and it ended up feeling more like a book report in school <laughs> and I was reminded why I didn't really like book reports in school <laughs> so I would much prefer to write fiction and just go on fun adventures in my mind yeah. and dream up wacky wild things for imaginary people to do and say rather than having to find like resources and bibliographies and quotations for mm -hmm. sure for sure and I bet you're thinking in your head so that's why I didn't like book reports yes yeah. exactly there so to all if there are any people in school listening to this right now that are struggling in their English classes have faith if you like writing your English English class is not an indicator of whether or not you could be an author I was never good at English class I did not like all the assigned reading books I was much better at math and science don't worry about it your options are still wide open. Just listen to the teacher and try to do this stuff, but don't sweat it if it's not your uh, your easiest yeah. class. Your forte, yeah. 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 I think that, I mean, this is, of course, there are some books that I like for assigned reading, but I feel like assigned reading really kind of takes away from a kid's love of reading because... It's no fun to be forced to read a certain book. Like, if your teacher's just telling you, oh, you have to read The Hobbit, oh, you have to read James and the Giant Peach, which I'm not calling those bad books. I'm just, those are just examples. Right. Um, right. And then, like, you have to find the theme of those books. Yeah. And you have to find the, all that, oh my 
goodness I disliked it very strongly (laughs) yeah it's just like when I just wanted to read for fun exactly and it's like when a teacher puts on a movie in class and then they say oh yeah take notes about this movie yeah Mm -hmm. it it it, that hurt I understand the reasoning behind it I get it now and I wish that I paid a little bit more attention because understanding themes and character arcs would definitely come in handy right but it's not the end all be all if you don't get it your first this time around true so now it's time for the final question of the interview the question i've asked every person i've ever interviewed if you could be or meet any literary character you could meet your favorite author or it could be your favorite book character or character from mythological stories in your case maybe so out of all of those who would you want to meet or who would you want to be and why I am awful at these kind of questions, but because because I can't like remember who all my options are. Right. I don't know if other people have like a favorite or something, but for me, as soon as I read a book and put it aside, it's like boom gone out of my head, and I can't Definitely. recall like yeah. books I read last week. So that's really hard for me. So I did a quick like Google search of literary characters because <laughs> I was like, who, who have I read? Yeah. I looked at these books here and I'm like, I don't know, maybe. Um, and I came up with Charlie from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory because he was such a nice kid. Right. Like, he was yeah. just genuinely a nice human being. I don't think I'd get any surprises if I met him. And also now he has a chocolate factory and I really like Willy Wonka candies. Those are like the everlasting gobstoppers were my favorite until gummy bears. So yeah, I would vote a kid with a candy factory and a heart of gold. That sounded pretty good. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I would totally agree. And plus you meet a nice kid, but also, you know, they have a chocolate factory. No biggie. Like Bonus. Yeah. Huge bonus. And like that flying thing yeah. that they went in at the end like yeah. that sounds like so much fun yes I mean and if you're friends with them you could basically get unlimited chocolate who doesn't yes. want that right yeah I'm very practical that sounded like a winner <laughs> yeah and plus you get to hear the Oompa Loompas with their really cool songs all the time it mm-hmm. would be magical it would be so this has been such a great talk thank you again for joining me Malia and for sharing such warm and thoughtful answers And I'm so glad you could just join us on E-Train Talks and share your story. You're not just an incredible author, but you're also an incredible literacy advocate. You're advocating for those kids in Hawaii, but also just in general through your Books for Maui fundraiser. And I feel like people are literacy advocates, not just like, but because it's just by being authors, because you're giving your story, you're giving hope to kids through your stories. So what you do so so phenomenal so inspiring thank you for everything that you do and for joining me on e-train talks thank you so much for having me